With the epidemic of obesity in the United States has come a virtual epidemic of di diabetes as well. The American Diabetes Association estimates that there's 29 million Americans with diabetes, and a lot of, a lot of them are still unrecognized. To provide us an update on the treatment of type 2 diabetes, it's a pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Matt Freeby. Dr. Freeby is an assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCLA, and he is the associate director of diabetes clinical programs. I give you Dr. Freeby. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, it's difficult uh, to go after uh, Dr. Watson. She's, uh, she definitely is a rock star. I've been tasked with uh, speaking on diabetes management, in particular diabetes therapies. I also think that it's important to uh, step back and, and talk about the goals of diabetes therapy in 2015. Uh, I do think that over the last decade or so, we've really uh, received a whole lot more data in terms of our goals of therapy that ultimately are going to impact uh, the therapies that you're recommending for your patients. So with that, I'm going to step back and, and, and talk about two cases. I want to paint a clinical picture that, uh, that diabetes is not one size fits all. So these are two patients. The first is Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is a 54-year-old gentleman with a medical history of hypertension and newly diagnosed type 2. He has no history of diabetes complications. He's a smoker, and his medications include lisinopril. On exam, his BMI is 27.5. He's overweight. His blood pressure is 135 over 82. His exam is otherwise unremarkable. His laboratory results are notable for an A1C of 8.5%. It's elevated. His total cholesterol is 183, and his urinary microalbumin to creatinine ratio is undetectable. So that's in comparison with Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is 63, almost a decade older. His medical history includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, and type 2 diabetes of 10 years duration. He's a non-smoker, and he's on multiple medications. They include metformin, glipizide, glargine, lisinopril, atenolol, aspirin, and atorvastatin. So I want to, uh, and um, Mr. Jones, his, uh, he is heavier than, than Mr. Smith. His BMI is 32. His blood pressure is about the same as Mr. Smith. His A1C is the same. His total cholesterol is the same. His urinary microalbumin to creatinine ratio is elevated in this case, with now with 10 years of diabetes. So uh, I want to just, uh, when I paint that clinical picture, I want you to, rem to be reminded of those two patients. I'm going to come back to those two patients. I'm going to uh, speak to their control as well as um, therapy, but I don't think that I have to belabor the point that uh, this is an epidemic in terms of diabetes. Um, over 29 million people, even just a few years ago, um, have type 2 diabetes, uh, of which about 8 million people are undiagnosed. It's getting close to 10% of our population have diabetes. So it's a, it's a growing epidemic. Uh, and it's not just the fact that, that diabetes become more and more common. There are multiple complications and comorbidities. Retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy are microvascular complications. Just to remind you, we want to remind our patients to undergo uh, eye exams as well as urinary microalbumin screening on an annual basis, as well as to, to look at those feet just to make sure that, uh, that if there is neuropathy that you have recommendations um, in hand for those patients. Uh, we know that cardiovascular death rates are higher in this population, as well as stroke risk is, is elevated. So I'm going to talk about two, pa uh, two studies, um, and, and again, to kind of focus on our goals of therapy. Uh, and, and again, to go back to Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones and ask you a couple of questions. But the first is UKPDS, and I think you guys all, all know UKPDS. It's, it was one of the first big works um, in type 2 diabetes that ultimately kind of landed us to our goals, um, our A1C goals. This was a study that was conducted back in the 1970s uh, up to 1991 in the UK. They recruited over 5,000 patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes between the ages of 25 and 65 years. They targeted conventional treatment in A1C about 8% to in uh, intensive therapy in A1C of about 7%. I think you guys all know the data, but the data um, suggested obviously that microvascular complications were much reduced with uh, lower in A1Cs. So every 1% A1C decrease, there's a reduction in microvascular complications by risk for about, of about 35%. 
There was also a reduction in myocardial um, infarction events, and this looked, um, as opposed to microvascular disease complications, in which there seemed to be kind of a, a, a leveling off of complications at about 7%. Um, for macrovascular events, it looked as though those continue to march down well below 7%. Uh, mortality also seemed to be impacted. Again, for every 1% A1C decrease, um, there appeared to be reductions in mortality. So I do want to remind you, again, this, these UK PDS baseline characteristics may not necessarily be every patient that you see in clinic. Uh, the average age was 53. BMI, th these patients were overweight but not obese. Uh, the average A1C was actually quite high, 9.1% on average. Uh, Oh, well over 50% of these patients were smoking, and very few, about 25, one in four, 25% uh, one in four patients were using antihypertensives, as well as um, pretty much no one was using lipid lowering medications. This is obviously before the, uh, the big studies in statins. So again, this is probably something similar um, to our, our first patient, Mr. Smith. And I, I don't think that I, again, need to, to talk about ACCORD too much, but the ACCORD trial um, <clears throat> was published in 2008. It and ADVANCE, the ADVANCE trial and the ACCORD trial were two big trials more recently that looked at um, microvascular complications in our type 2 population, but also they wanted to look and see that if we intensively lower A1C levels, can we, can we actually reduce macrovascular events? So following up on that UK PDS data, uh, looking to see can we actually make an impact? If we get that A1C down to 6%, can we reduce mortality? Can we reduce uh, cardiovascular disease uh, risk? So in this study, they uh, recruited patients with type 2 between the ages of 40 and 79 with either cardiovascular disease or at least two risk factors for cardiovascular disease. They randomized uh, over 10,000 patients uh, targeting intensive therapy to less than 6%, or standard therapy somewhere between 7 and 7.9%. I just want to remind you, in this study, they, they used any and all medications available for diabetes. They did not use an algorithm, uh, just using a, a specific set of medications. They used everything. So this is, this is uh, looking at the A1C lowering effect on micro and, vascular, micro and macrovascular events. They did show, obviously, that there was a reduction in microvascular disease, but um, as you can see here, and as you probably all know, there was an increased risk for death, um, mortality, um, in the intensively treated group. This was statistically significant in terms of the risk increase in those intensively treated, trying to knock those A1C da A1Cs down to, to less than 6%. Um, this was uh, death from any cause, but also death from cardiovascular causes as well. So, uh, you know, we don't um, <clears throat> know uh, why uh, ex specifically um, patients had this increased mortality, and I'll, I'll speak to it in a second, but I do also want to remind you these baseline demographics, again, probably closer um, to Mr. Jones, a little bit older than our UK PDS population, average age of 62 years, duration of 10 years, of diabetes, uh, an obese population with a BMI of 32, an A1C that was a little bit lower than our UK PDS population. But now these patients are not smoking, almost 90% are receiving antihypertensives, and about two, almost two uh, out of every three patients are using lipid lowering uh, treatments. So again, those patients are uh, taking other medications potentially to reduce cardiovascular disease, um, and so uh, maybe potentially taking away any benefit or of of uh, cardiovascular disease um, from diabetes. So, you know, there have been many post hoc analyses uh, related to this. So, why did mortality increase? And I think that everyone is holding the uh, thinking that it's probably related to hypoglycemia. Um, if you look at this, is a meta analysis looking at multiple trials, which included UKPDS, uh, the ACCORD trial, as well as the ADVANCE trial, and a couple of others. But obviously, trying to target an A1C down much lower than, say, uh, standard therapy is going to increase the risk for hypoglycemia. We know that. And hypoglycemia does, has been shown to increase the risk for arrhythmias. And obviously, arrhythmias can increase the risk for sudden cardiac death. So um, it seems plausible that um, hypoglycemia might be the risk, though in post hoc analyses, um, there is some debate in terms, of, um, in terms of its cause. And maybe hypoglycemia is more. Um, just a, a marker of frailty rather than the actual cause. But I think, you know, time will tell. So I, I just wanted to quickly review these two studies, again, to paint this, this picture that, that again, uh, two populations of patients may not necessarily be the same. And so with this, I just want to ask, I've been asked to ask some questions here. And, and to remind you, Mr. Smith is a 50-year-old gentleman with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. He's an active smoker, though now he's quit. Uh, he's no history of coronary artery disease. 
And so what A1C would you target for, for him, for Mr. Smith? Would you target an A1C of A, less than 6%, B, less than 7%, C, less than 7.5%, or D, less than 8%? So yes, I agree with 71% of you with an A1C of less than 7%. I guess you could uh, conceivably uh, target an A1C of less than 7.5%. He does have a couple of risk factors. Though he is newly diagnosed young, I would target an A1C of less than 7%. Um, and the reason why I would not target anything lower is this data to remind you that essentially there's a leveling off in terms of that risk for microvascular complications at hitting at about 7%. There's really nephropathy and neuropathy once you hit an A1C of less than 7%. So again, in this, this population, I would uh, target seven. So um, that's, Ms. that's Mr. Smith. This is Mr. Jones. Again, Mr. Jones is about a decade older with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, and 10 years of diabetes. He's on multiple medications, um, including three for diabetes, metformin, glipizide, and uh, insulin. Uh, what would you target his A1C? Would it be A, less than 6%, B, less than 7%, C, less than 7.5%, or D, less than 8%. All right, so for this gentleman, I would, I would target less than 7.5%. So he has a history of coronary artery disease. This is, this is someone within our ACCORD trial data. So he fits very specifically within the ACCORD trial. And, and I purposely did not mention it, but ultimately the ACCORD trial targeted an A1C down less than 6% versus 7%, but they ultimately achieved an A1C of about 6.4% versus about 7.5% in those who were um, uh, treated under standard care. So ultimately, the, the, the recommendation now is, is that for patients with coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes to target an A1C of less than 7.5%. So the guidelines uh, in 2015 from the American Diabetes Association, this is, I do adhere to these guidelines. Uh, generally speaking, we target an A1C of less than 7%. Uh, with preprandial plasma glucose levels 70 to 130, I think 70 is probably a little bit tight. Um, as well as two-hour peak postprandial plasma glucose levels of less than 180. If you're hitting these goals, you're typically hitting an A1C of less than 7%. Now, with that said, goals should be individualized. I just tried to paint the picture of, of these two patients. Um, and goals should be individualized based off of duration of diabetes, individual patient considerations, comorbid conditions, including cardiovascular disease or advanced microvascular complications, possibly targeting an A1C of less than 7.5%. So in patients with hypoglycemia unawareness, unable to feel their lows, I definitely would increase that A1C target, reduce that risk for hypoglycemia. And one that's been studied uh, much to a much greater degree uh, recently are, are patients with advanced age and limited life expectancy. And, and there are guidelines out there um, that would suggest that those with some form of either mild, moderate, or severe cognitive impairment, we should be targeting A1Cs that are higher. So in this population, targeting A1C less than 7.5, less than 8, less than 8.5%, depending upon mild, moderate, moderate, or severe cognitive impairment, again, trying to reduce that risk for hypoglycemia. All right, so we've talked through goals of therapy. I'm going to uh, transition here to talking about our therapy in, in diabetes. And again, I mean, you guys are seeing plenty of diabetes out in clinic. Um, this is becoming, uh, again, much, much more common. So I want to step back, though. Before we talk about the actual um, medications, um, I, I want to give you a big plug and or give a big plug in terms of diabetes education. And I think that this is absolutely our foundation of diabetes care. Um, and this is a Cochrane database review, looking or study review, in looking at group-based diabetes education. So this is uh, this is where patients come in, um, up to ten patients at a time, into a class, into a workshop, up to eight hours at a time, receive uh, uh, education in terms of uh, dietary modifications, exercise, talk about diabetes burnout, talk about medications, talk about everything 
over, over a day-long um, uh, period, really to provide them with a foundation for diabetes care. And you can see here that four, out, four to six months out, four to six months, a year, two years out, there are significant reductions in terms of A1C. Two years out, there's an A1C decrease of about 1% on average in these patients, um, which is uh, significant since this is the equivalent of a moderately efficacious uh, medication for diabetes. It's not just um, A1C decreases, but also secondary endpoints in terms of weight loss, uh, reductions in systolic blood pressure, as well as reductions in the numbers of diabetes medications. So, uh, there are, we are now, um, but have been bombarded with multiple medications for diabetes from the 1920s, 1950s. There were only three classes of medications out on the market, but since the mid-1990s, we've had just this explosion in the number of diabetes medications. So I think it's really important to understand kind of the effects of each of these medications in terms of the risks and their benefits. I'm going to uh, go through these medications with the knowledge of the pathophysiology of diabetes. Um, just want to remind you that up on the top up here is the pancreas, and the pancreas in particular, there's a loss of insulin secretion. That is kind of one of the, 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 the main uh, factors in terms of diabetes progression. It's less known, but obviously here there's a reduction in glucose. I'm sorry, there's an increase in glucagon secretion that increases glucose levels um, up. There is a regulation defect in the brain. There is a change in uh, renal threshold glucose levels. Our kidneys are trying to hold on to every bit of glucose within the bloodstream. As you all know, there is also insulin resistance within the muscle, the adipose tissue, as well as the liver. There's an increase in hepatic gluconeogenesis, as well as this incretin effect, which I will explain um, in a short um, bit. So this is very busy with very small lettering, but up on the top there, um, which is my, again, my foundation is healthy eating, weight control, and increased physical activity. Again, I think that that is really the number one thing that we should be um, discussing with our patients if you have the time. Um, but in terms of the first line therapy, um, I think most endocrinologists would not agree that it's metformin. Metformin is our first line therapy. And why is that a first-line therapy? It's, it's efficacious. There's an A1C decrease of about 1% to 2%. Although we don't know the specific mechanism of action, it decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis. Um, it is beneficial in that it is either weight neutral or there is a modest amount of weight loss um, with the, the use of this medication. There's no hypoglycemia, so this does not stimulate insulin secretion. This essentially um, improves insulin uh, resistance. The uh, side effects and risks and concerns, the number one, obviously, that you guys probably all see um, are GI-related, diarrhea, GI bloating. Um, the one that we always, though, get worried about is lactic acidosis. So there are some contraindications to remind you with metformin use, creatinine levels of 1.5 or greater in men or 1.4 or greater in women. I think these, these guidelines may change at some point in the near future with studies that are showing maybe that, that metformin uh, may be safer at higher creatinine levels, but at this point, those are the cutoff levels um, in terms of contraindications. Relative contraindications include hepatic dysfunction, heart failure, advanced age, as well as heavy alcohol intake. So I'm again going to go back and, and ask another question because this is something that I, I see in my clinic a fair amount. Um, but I'm going to go back to Mr. Smith to kind of to, to make the point. But again, he is newly diagnosed with diabetes. Despite dietary and exercise modifications, his A1C is 7.9%. I think his goal would be 7% or less. We want to try and decrease this down. So we're going to use medication. And this first line medication we're going to use is metformin. So Metformin is added, but he complains of significant bloating after one week at 500 milligrams daily. So my question to you, and again, this is something that I get in clinic, is, is what would you recommend next? What would you do? Would you A, continue to titrate metformin because the symptoms will improve? Would you B, switch to metformin ER 500 milligrams daily and titrate? Would you C, switch to citagliptin 100 milligrams daily? Or would you D, switch to glipizide XL 5 milligrams daily and titrate it? So I agree with, uh, with you. Um, I would switch to uh, metformin ER, 500 milligrams daily. So after one week at a very low dose of metformin, it is unlikely that this patient uh, will um, see any benefit in terms of a reduction in GI side effects. 
they're probably just not gonna take the medication. I think it's a little early to switch to citagliptin as well as glipizide. And this is the data that I have here that would suggest that metformin ER or the XR formulation should be used. You can see here that in the clear bar, that the, um, the risk for any GI-related adverse event is well over 25%. And that if you use the XR formulation here in black, uh, that that is reduced, in, it's cut in half in terms of the GI-related side effects. Um, diarrhea is reduced significantly. I don't think that there were enough um, events in terms of nausea and dyspepsia and the others to show to statistically significant uh, event reductions. But again, I do think that in that patient who really is not tolerating metformin, um, and I ask my patients just to make sure because sometimes they just stop it because uh, then they don't want to tell you, um, but I do, um, I, I do ask patients if they're having any GI-related uh, adverse events with metformin and consider that switch. So again, I, I, metformin is our number one medication. Um, we do know that patients with type 2 diabetes, most patients with type 2 diabetes at some point are going to continue to um, have losses of, of beta cells um, and insulin production and ultimately are going to acquire second line therapy. The question is, is what do you use after metformin? I, I go back to this slide from Diabetes Care from the American Diabetes Association. Again, metformin and dietary and exercise modifications, kind of our frontline therapy. But you can see just below metformin in these boxes, in these various colored boxes, you can see that each of the medications is second line therapy in type 2 diabetes. So there's not one medication that is recommended that is second line therapy. That's sulfonylureas, TZDs, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, insulin, SGLT-2 inhibitors. Each of these medications really are second line therapy and the decision for use of these medications is based off of multiple factors, off of efficacy, hypoglycemia risk, weight gain, weight loss, major side effects, as well as the costs. You know, this is a conversation, a lot of times I might have one medication that I think might um, be uh, best for a patient, but a lot of times I may spend just a short period of time uh, with the patient to try and uh, come up with the, the best next medication for that, that patient. So I'm going to talk about each of the classes of medications briefly um, and, and uh, talk through in terms of their, um, their effect on pathophysiology. The sulfonylureas and the glyonides are the first two classes of medications. They impact the pancreas um, and increase insulin secretion. So the sulfonylureas, glyburide, glipizide, glomeparide, um, as well as the glyonides, repaglinide and ateglinide, are pretty efficacious. With an A1C decrease of somewhere between 1% to 2%, the glenides might be a little bit less um, efficacious than the, the sulfonylureas. Both of these classes of medications bind the sulfonyl receptor on the beta cell. They stimulate insulin secretion, so essentially they're squeezing that pancreas, squeezing that sponge to try and release insulin independent of any food intake. The glenides are a little bit different than the sulfonylureas in that they're shorter acting. They're much quicker on and off medications. Um, and there's extensive experience with these medications. We know that they reduce microvascular complications. Downsides include hypoglycemia as, weight gain, as well as weight gain with both of them. Um, the difference, again, between these two medications that I, that I discussed is that you can see here in this, you can see, I think, I think it's in purple here, glyburide. For the most part, there's a relatively stable insulin release. Again, independent of any food intake over a 12-hour period. And I think it's here in green here. Uh, the neteglinide, which is a glyonide, is quicker on and off. So you take the neteglinide up, insulin secretion, and back down. Take neteglinide up and back down. So um, again, this, there is a time and place potentially for glyonides. Um, I, I don't use them as frequently as sulfonylureas. But in your patients, maybe with more hypoglycemia risk, maybe who are skipping lunch, or skipping a meal and maybe at higher risk for hypoglycemia, I might use the glyonides in that population. And so you tell, say, look, you know, if you are eating two meals a day, take the nateglinide or take the repaglinide um, at those two meals only, and that's gonna be the equivalent of maybe a short-acting insulin equivalent. Um, <clears throat> whereas the, uh, the other medications, the other sulfonylureas, the longer-acting medications are much more stable, um, a longer-acting um, insulin for those with higher A1Cs, less of a risk for, um, for an A1C, or rather for hypoglycemia. So the next two classes of medications are from the incretin uh, effect, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, they in, uh, if impact uh, the gut as well as the uh, pancreas and the brain. Um, it is important, I always, I, 
I think this is an incredible class of medications in terms of they, the, from the, uh, the gut, GIP and GLP-1 are two hormones, the incretin hormones that are um, secreted that ultimately have an impact on multiple organs within our body, the adipose tissue uh, as well as uh, the pancreas, both to increase insulin secretion as well as decre uh, decrease glucagon secretion. Um, they affect the brain as well as the stomach. The DPP-4 inhibitors in particular, um, what, they, um, what they do is they impact this, uh, this dipeptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme. So DPP-4 breaks down GIP and GLP-1. So if we are um, inhibiting this enzyme, we are increasing GIP and GLP-1 to have its effect um, within, within the body. So there are four currently, I think there are four currently uh, approved medications on the market for DPP-4 inhibitors. They are, um, there's another one coming out pretty much every month. Citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and allogliptin. Uh, these are oral medications. They are um, modest in their efficacy up to about a 1% A1C decrease. Again, uh, they inhibit the degradation of GLP-1 and GIP. The benefit of these medications is there's minimal hypoglycemia risk. So by increasing this insulin secretion, they do so in food-dependent manner. Um, so insulin will be increased only when we eat. Uh, there's no weight gain associated with these medications. Now, the, the side effects or risks or concerns, um, you know, the, the biggest one that I think that's out there right now um, that we see on TV um, from uh, various ads is pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. I cannot truthfully tell you yes or no at this point. The FDA has, is looking at this, I think, probably on more than an, on an annual basis. They have required the companies to, um, <clears throat> to follow this in terms of a risk evaluation mitigation studies to look and see if there might be an increased risk for pancre pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. Um, <clears throat> within the clinical trials, it was shown that there's definitely a small risk for nasopharyngitis and UTIs. And uh, each of these medications, except for linocliptin, do require some renal adjustment. The GLP-1 receptor agonists um, <clears throat> essentially do impact, uh, again, GLP-1. They are stronger in terms of their impact on insulin secretion, reduction, and glucagon. Uh, they also really do uh, affect the brain much more than the DPP-4 inhibitors, increasing satiety as well as nausea, and um, have an impact on body weight. Um, they also decrease gastric emptying. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are five currently approved medications out on the market. Bieta, uh, or rather exenatide, is a BID medication. Liraglutide is a once daily medication. And then the other three, exenatide LAR, albaglutide, and dulaglutide, are once weekly medications. Uh, they are a bit stronger than the DPP-4 inhibitors, up to about a 1.5% A1C decrease. Um, they are, again, GLP-1 receptor agonists. They are injectables. The benefits, uh, again, just similar to the DPP-4 inhibitors, because this is a food-dependent insulin uh, secretion, there's really very minimal hypoglycemia risk. Um, uh, but there is also this, this very strong benefit of weight loss um, associated with these medications. The side effects, uh, number one side effect really is nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, again, similar to the DPP-4 inhibitors, um, the FDA is looking at, uh, at pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer risk. Um, there may be this increased risk for acute renal failure, primarily related to volume depletion in those who are not tolerating PO. Uh, relative contraindications with gastroparesis as well as uh, low renal function. Uh, there is also a concern in terms of thyroid C-cell tumors. There's, a, again, a risk evaluation mitigation study ongoing for this class of medications. Um, in particular, um, it was shown in liraglutide in rodents, in rodent models in rats and mice, uh, that there was a dose-dependent and treatment duration-dependent increased risk for thyroid C-cell tumors. So th thyroid C-cell tumors are this precursor for medullary thyroid cancer, which is uh, kind of a big, bad thyroid cancer um, in our endocrine world. Um, <clears throat> So at this point, uh, this class of medications is contraindicated in patients with medullary thy thyroid cancer. Thankfully, medullary thyroid cancer is incredibly uncommon, um, as well as patients with MEN2 um, because of the risk for medullary thyroid um, CA. At this point, um, it does not appear that, that, uh, that uh, there is this impact on th thyroid C-cell tumors in humans, but again, uh, I think data, time will tell. So the TZDs, uh, I think you guys all uh, obviously know the history related to the TZDs. They impact our, um, our insulin uh, sensitivity at the adipocyte level. Uh, 
They, there are two currently uh, approved medications out on the market, Pio and rosiglitazone. Rosiglitazone is actually back on the market after effectively being pulled off the market for a while um, from the early meta-analysis. Um, uh, subsequent studies have shown that there probably is not that increased risk for cardiovascular disease like it was once thought. They are pretty strong with an A1C decrease of 1 to 2 percent, um, so quite strong. They are PPAR gamma ag um, uh, agonists and increased peripheral ins uh, sensitivity. In doing so, they do not increase insulin secretion, so there's no risk for hypoglycemia related to these medications. That is definitely a benefit. They um, also, because they are um, uh, impact insulin sensitivity, they may be possibly beta cell sparing. So there is one study out there to suggest that you get that A1C down, and as compared to metformin and a sulfonylurea, that A1C may uh, stay down longer with a TZD rather than the other classes of medication. So again, maybe beta cell sparing. With that said, there are multiple side effects and risks related to this medication, um, edema, weight gain, fractures, um, fractures statistically significant in women, not in men. Um, symptomatic heart failure, uh, liver dysfunction, so LFT monitoring, as well as this um, potential for bladder cancer risk, which came out in the last two or three years. Um, and I think that there's definitely this, this nidus, um, uh, because there appear to be crystals that uh, form in the bladder uh, with, uh, with use of the TZDs. One I did not put on here, but also macular edema is, 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 has been seen with, with TZD use. So I'm going to ask one more question, and it's related to a, 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 new, a new patient, Ms. Wilson, who I have not presented. Uh, but she's 65. She has coronary disease, uh, CHF with an ejection fraction of 25%, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Despite dietary and exercise modifications, her A1C increases to 8.4%. Her recent creatinine is 1.6. So my question to you is, what medication would you add next? Metformin, Cidagliptin 100 milligrams daily, would you start pioglitazone 15 milligrams daily, or would you D start Cidagliptin 50 milligrams daily? Yes, I agree with you. So I think metformin and uh, pioglitazone are contraindicated uh, because of the heart and the kidneys. Um, Citagliptin, although I did not go through it, um, does have renal adjustment associated with it. So we typically start at 100 milligrams with citagliptin for all of our patients, except for those who have renal dysfunction. Those with renal dysfunction, you guys can look at it, but essentially with, with slightly impaired uh, renal dysfunction, there is a reduction down to 50 milligrams. With pretty uh, severe renal dysfunction, it's down to 25 milligrams daily. So the newest class of medications out on the market are the, uh, for diabetes are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, they, are, um, they impact the kidneys. So to remind you, the kidneys are trying to do their best to hold on to glucose within the bloodstream. What the SGL2 inhibitors do is, is they uh, change that threshold, essentially allow more glucose to be spilled out um, in the urine. There are two currently approved medications out on the market, DAPA and CANA. Um, they are modest in their A1C decrease up to about 1%. They enhance renal glucose excretion. The benefits of these medications include that they, um, because they do not increase insulin secretion, there's no hypoglycemia risk. They do also appear to be diuretics because they are allowing for glucose to spill out. Fluid or uh, water is also going to be released. Um, so there is some, a blood pressure reduction effect. Uh, they are weight neutral. They may have a little bit of weight loss. Um, the primary concern is related to the fact that uh, glucose is being spilled in urine and there might be an increased risk for genitourinary infections. There may be some increased risk with acute renal dysfunction, with volume depletion. These are new medications, so we don't have a whole lot of a track record in terms of time on these medications. And again, they are renally uh, dosed or not recommended with low GFRs. So uh, some other classes of medications that I want to just briefly review. Um, these are three other uh, medication classes, the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, which acarbose um, is the medication, which has been around for a while with a, um, an A1C decrease of about a half a percent. Uh, they inhibit carbohydrate absorption, so essentially they do not allow the gut to, to absorb the food, the carbohydrates. They're locally active, they're non-systemic, um, they do not cause hypoglycemia. The big side effect, which is the reason why they're not really used, um, are GI-related, flatulence, um, and so really have not taken off in, in the U.S. 
Two other classes of medications that have been repurposed mo more recently, um, just in the last five years or so, the dopamine agonists, uh, such as bromocryptine, again, very modest in its A1C decrease, about a, a third of a, of a point drop. Uh, the, they impact through their dopamine receptor agonist activity. The effect, though, within the body really is unknown in terms of what that mechanism is. Um, they rarely cause hypoglycemia, but they do has, have some side effects, including hypotension, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and headaches. The bile acid sequestrants, such as cholecephalum, have um, been repurposed as well with a modest A1C decrease of about a half a percent. Their diabetes mechanism action is really not well understood. Um, they do not cause hypoglycemia. They have this benefit of LDL lowering, but they also do have GI-related side effects as well as they do increase the uh, triglyceride levels. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, long-acting insulin. I'm just going to briefly touch upon it. I'm not going to talk about uh, short-acting insulin because I th thought that that might be too much for this dis discussion today. But um, <clears throat> there are um, uh, four long-acting insulins that are currently approved out on the market. Um, uh, NPH, Glargine, Detamir, and Glargine U300 to remind you that all of our insulins are a U100 concentration. There's this new concentration of Glargine U300 um, <clears throat> that's now currently out on the market. I actually don't think that it's in pharmacies quite yet, but um, uh, I think it'll be in pharmacies shortly. Um, the benefit of long-acting insulins is that the effect is incremental. So essentially, adding low dose of insulin up, increasing that dose up, you can have anywhere from a very uh, low A1C decrease to a, a big impact on A1C. Insulin duration, uh, NPH is somewhere probably about a half a day. The other medications are around 24 hours, maybe a little less than 24 hours, so a little over 24 hours in terms of, um, in terms of their um, length of, uh, of action. Some of it may be also impacted by the amount or the dose of insulin that you give. Lower doses may be lasting 24 hours, higher doses lasting up closer to 24 hours in length. So in your patients with type 2 diabetes who are getting higher doses, it's probably not as much of an issue. Um, in terms of benefits, uh, really there are minimal side effects or contraindications with this. I mean, this is the, I obviously will use insulin um, in my patients who have um, significant comorbidities um, because, again, as I tell my patients, this is the most natural medicine that I, could, I can give them from a diabetes perspective. Um, and again, I, as I mentioned, dose titration, um, it's beneficial. Um, <clears throat> the risks or, or concerns related to are hypoglycemia, but I think that, you know, done in uh, slowly titrating doses, the risk uh, for hypoglycemia in, with insulin is, is relatively minimal. Uh, weight gain is absolutely there. Um, but again, I mean, I think that uh, these uh, insulin is, is, is not a bad thing. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that I have the resources in place to teach uh, my patients how to use insulin. But I definitely view this as a second-line therapy, even though historically it's been thought of as a last-line, last-ditch effort for those who are about to go on dialysis or about to die. And, and I try and really kind of um, make the point with my patients who I think, you know, may require insulin at some point in the future, just, you know, at least telling them, look, insulin's not a bad thing, and, and kind of laying that groundwork uh, for, for our patients. So those are our classes of medications for diabetes. Um, <clears throat> just to, again, to kind of step back and remind you, uh, this is a slide from the American Diabetes Association. These are guidelines. I agree with these guidelines in that, um, again, either our foundation or kind of the top of our treatment are our lifestyle modifications, healthy eating, weight control, increased physical activity, providing that diabetes education for our patients so they can really um, um, have an impact, have a benefit um, long term. And that every medication after metformin is second line therapy at this point. There's no one best medication. Um, there is one study that's ongoing right now. I think they're about two years, one to two years into recruitment. It's called the GRADE trial, G-R-A-D-E. Uh, the GRADE trial uh, is a study that is an NIH sponsored, very large trial. Uh, multiple diabetes centers throughout the United States looking to see what might be our next best medication after metformin. So those who have failed metformin in terms of durability, safety, um, looking at a bunch of different uh, factors and ultimately trying to come up with an idea. What is this? Is it, is it a sulfonary? Is it insulin? What is, what, what is our next best uh, medication after metformin? So with that, I'm going to stop and I thank you very much. Okay, we're going to do four questions, so raise your hands, we'll get a microphone to you. First, if we look at your first patient, the non-obese gentleman, yep. uh, 
Can we modify it slightly and give him a fasting blood sugar in the 130s, but an A1C that's already at target, say he's in the mid sixes. Yeah. So it's a new diabetic, no complications, and he's already at target. What do you do with him? Yeah, so you could, uh, you could argue a, number, a couple of different ways to, to treat this patient. Um, with an A1C of, of 6%, I would um, probably congratulate him, say that you've obviously made some, some significant changes in your life. You've probably reduced carbohydrates. You've probably started some exercise. You've lost some weight. And if you look at the data, I mean, from the Diabetes Prevention Program, the DPP that was published about 15 years ago, you know, we've kind of knocked him back down. I mean, he, once he has a diabetes diagnosis, he has a diabetes diagnosis. But we've kind of knocked him down in kind of an, an impaired range, impaired uh, either fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance range with an A1C of 6%. In terms of looking at those patients, in terms of kind of their long-term risk for progression, it's dietary and exercise modifications that wins out. Um, you could make an argument to use metformin. Um, there are many that are out there within the diabetes world that would say, look, metformin, it's cheap. It is, we know the side effect profile. It really works well, does not cause hypoglycemia. We could use a little bit of metformin um, in this patient. But again, I, I think that you really need to, you know, if you need to take the patient for who he is. And, you know, if he wants medications, you could consider it. But it, in my hands, I would typically recommend continued dietary exercise modifications and weight maintenance. Are you recommending treatment for uh, pre-diabetes, people with uh, uh, elevated blood sugars, but uh, normal hemoglobin A1Cs? So similar to that, I mean, it's along, pretty much along the same lines that I, that I was just saying in terms of this gentleman who was just newly diagnosed, but kind of down, uh, the diabetes prevention program. I mean, it, it essentially, metformin was compared to lifestyle modifications. Lifestyle modifications did better than metformin. So um, <clears throat> in a high, high-risk population, you can use metformin, but I primarily will recommend lifestyle modifications in this population. Again, it's not easy to do and not, you know, patients may not necessarily adhere to it, but if you have a program that's in place within your hospital system, I would absolutely try and access that um, because that, that will impact someone's long-term risk for diabetes in the future. Sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, any good apps for deciding which drug to use after metformin? You know, and number two, previously heard something about going to inhaled insulin. Is there anything along that? Line at all in research. So the first is the diabetes app, and I, I, there are plenty of diabetes apps out there. I, I but primarily related to um, controlling one's sugars and monitoring one's sugars. Now, in terms of this kind of algorithm that's in place, I don't know if there's actually an, an app out there um, for that. That's a good question. Um, but it is uh, the American Diabetes Association uh, publishes their guidelines on an annual basis. The American Diabetes Association publishes these, these guidelines, and that actual. Uh, figure is within that paper on an annual running basis. Yeah, and the second question? Okay. Yeah, so uh, there is a, a there, it, inhaled insulin is out on the market. Um, it's, uh, it was taken off the market, well actually it was just pulled um, by the company um, many years ago and a new company took it over and it is now being marketed, it is, it is now in pharmacies. Um, it is the equivalent of more of like your, I didn't go into the short acting insulins, but it is more of the equivalent of short acting insulins. Um, <clears throat> in terms of those medications, uh, patients require pulmonary function testing up front, um, and there remains that, that, that question in terms of whether or not, how much they're gonna impact um, pulmonary function long term. Reasoning, the, the reasoning for contraindications of um, no use of metformin after 80, and then what? Yeah, so I think it's primarily related to um, <clears throat> uh, renal function um, and the potential for the increased risk for lactic acidosis. Now, with that said, I view it as a relative contraindication. I don't view it as a, um, <clears throat> an absolute contraindication. So you, again, have to take every patient for who they are. If it is a, if it is a healthy 85-year-old, I absolutely will really consider using metformin um, in that patient. Um, <clears throat> in terms of alternate therapies, um, I, you know, again, in this patient population, you want to go back and think about your goals of therapy. You know, what are the goals of therapy in someone who's 85 with multiple comorbidities? Um, do you want to target an A1C of seven, seven and a half, eight? You know, you could make an argument based off of comorbidities as well as cognitive impairment. So you really want to um, to uh, to look at that. And then the risk for hypoglycemia. So um, 
I will oftentimes choose my medication in this patient population to try and reduce the risk for hypoglycemia uh, because there is that significant impact in terms of any low blood sugar um, impacting a fall, which is going to obviously increase mortality risk.